equipping the saints about faith. Now, I'm going to begin this, this, this afternoon with a story, and it's a true story, and you're probably, you're probably hearing this story for the first time. Now, my wife cautioned me. She said, remember, and I'm, I'm setting my timer here, um, she cautioned me about my story. She said, your story sometimes are too long and drawn out, and it takes up time, but this is an essential story. And um, I want to share it. And there's a reason for sharing this. Now, the year is 2006. And um, Restoration Ministries and Smyrna Gospel Ministries were having issues. And it has been noised abroad that things were happening and that a split was imminent. So, you know, everybody was trying to do the best that they can in helping to see how best they could, you know, sort out the problem to fix what was, was taking place. Now, 2006. Uh, in the summer, it's Europe and camp meeting in Europe. And, and strangely, um, brothers David Clayton and Alan Stone were scheduled to be speaking in Europe at the same meetings. So the elders there, the leaders there, uh, I think brothers Erwin, brother Vlad, brother Janosch, and, 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 and the others, brother Jatsik at that, at that time as well, they were all in, interested in, 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 in Sitting together, let's sit together as brothers. Let's sit and see if we can reason this out. It is impossible for something to be happening among Christian um, brothers or ministries that can't be reconciled. So I think they were they were doing their best in trying to get this dealt with, and so they they decided to have a discussion to see if they can actually um, see how things can be you know uh, united, how we can unite some some more in a better way. And, 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 and avoid this, this split. So um, at, at this meeting as well, there was an, another brother, which is a new guy from Europe as well, one of the, those countries there. He was in a high position in the Adventist church. He lost his job for believing in the, in the anti, for uh, you know, standing against the Trinity, accepting the anti Trinitarian position. And so he also was there. I think his name was Paul, Brother Paul. I don't remember his, his last name. Um, so here they were in this discussion, and as, as always, as it has happened since 2005, every meeting that we went to, um, that the issues were to be discussed, um, they, 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 it was always that Br Brother David will do his presentation, Brother Allen will do his presentation, and so the people can understand. Well, you know, for all of these places that we have been, where, where I have been, in camp meetings abroad and, and all of that, Alan never actually did a presentation. He never did. They always had David up front, and they would quiz him and grill him and ask him all these questions, and, and this was no different. So here in Europe, they were um, talking about this, and they said, tell us what you're saying. So David went off, and he went into all the intricacies and, and, and the awesomeness of this plan of God to save us and, and what God did for us in Christ. Awesome. So they, they, they listened, and... Just, they just did not see it. Well, I'm talking about now this new brother, Paul, and Alan, because the other guys, the other elders, were in, in, in unison. Everybody saw it clearly. And so he went on, and, you know, they didn't see what he was saying. So they took a break, took a, um, you know, went for a walk, lots of air, and they all came. I think, where was I? I was at that place that they asked David to, 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 do, to do over what he did. And so... He decided, okay, even though it was, it was tired and all of that, he started going back over this amazing plan of God and, you know, in giving us this privilege of becoming sons and daughters and how he expounded on this, this plan of God. Anyway, he went into all of this and, and he told me, see, I wasn't there. So David was relating the story to me and he said, as he was talking, as he was going on, he said, this new brother, brother Paul, he said, um, he just shouted out, he said, I see it, I see it. It is so amazing. It is so awesome. And, and, and David told me, he said, when he looked over at Alan, he says, the first time he saw his face, he said his face was white. Like, like I, I mean, not the complexion, not, not that white. Like, went very pale and his mouth dropped open. He was so frightened at what Paul was saying. And he said, look, he said, brothers, I tell you, I came here to learn more about this anti-Trinitarian thing. But I think God had a better plan for me. And he said, this is so awesome. And God must have sent me here to, um, to learn this message. I mean, everybody was shocked with awe. 
at this because remember this was a new person this person had no understanding of, of either side you understand what i mean he he just came in as a new person and um to to to, to learn more to meet these these guys from the west you know um these leaders from the west and, and he said he didn't see it at first but he, he heard it a second time and he said yeah you just expressed alarm well i think i, I could finish the story but just kind of um finish um Prematurely, let me just tell you quickly what happened next. So everybody was just nobody knew what to do. Nobody dared say say anything. So anyway, they, they said so so so. I think just Vlad um, Vincent, brother Vlad said so. Alan, is there anything that you disagree with in terms of what David said? And he said no. Uh, I think I can say amen to that. And he said so. Is there any problems here now? And he said I don't see any problems. So. Everybody was just amazed and happy and glad that this actually this 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 rift or whatever it was was finally dealt with. And so they had a prayer and and they ended the meeting that night. But they went to sleep. I think Alan left. Alan left. Alan and Erwin left earlier because he had to be crossed the border into poor Poland, Poland before then. So he went ahead and David and Vlad and, uh, came afterwards. And um, very interesting. And I'll just tell you. They went into Poland, and when when David came, Alan was there first. When David came, the the, the brother, the, the the elder there in Poland, brother Yatsi, um, met Vlad and, and said, well, "No, well, they met with Alan first. He said, Alan, what is this we're hearing about you and David?" And he said, Alan said to him, "We will never see eye to eye." And so. See, David didn't know that. Vlad didn't know that. So they came afterwards, and the brother came and told um, Vlad what happened. And they were just so upset that they said, this guy, this guy, we left Germany with, with all of everything worked out. Now we're in Poland, and he's saying something different. Anyway, I think it became clear that the issue with, with, with Smyrna and the Restoration Ministry, with Alan and David, was not necessarily a doctrinal issue. It was something far more than doctrinal. But I just leave it there. Anyway, my main point for telling the story is the fact that the, the, the same story that was repeated over and over and over again finally made sense. The same story. And, and what, is, what is my point? My point is simply this. Repetition is the mother of learning. And, and the more you hear something, even if you think you know it, listen again. Because in doing so, See, Brother David said he read over a passage that he never even looked at before. He never thought of in this way before. And it's a passage that you, you, you go over and over and over. But it is so, so awesome how God says that these words are inspired. The word of God is inspired. And so when you look at them and you go and look at them, you're seeing different angles. You're seeing different things that sometimes you've never even seen before when you look at the verse. So that's what I'm going to ask you to do with me today. I want you to just be, be patient. Listen carefully to what is being said, and even if it's repeating a thought that you've heard before, then let's just go over it because it might be that something will be said that will truly be an inspiration to you. Um, I'm going to go to a well known passage. I'm going to go to the book of Mark, and this, this passage in Mark is very, very um, uh, familiar. Um, this passage in Mark is the ending part of Mark, Mark chapter. 16. I'm going to ask you to look with me at a couple of verses here. In fact, just two verses here in verses 17 and 18. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Now, look at what Jesus says here. Verse 17. And these, what did it say there, beloved? And these, what now? These signs shall follow them that believe. Notice who the signs follow. Them that believe. In my name, he says, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I want you to, to, to take careful note of, of the things that we just read here. In, in Jesus said these words. And now, I have some questions based on what we just read. The first question is, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to believe? And the next question is, what should we believe to become believers? 
Now, I'm going to look back at the verse again um, and just think about what it says. It says, these signs shall follow them that believe. That's what it just said. My question then is, believe what? What is it that you are to believe to have these signs follow? Isn't that a reasonable question? I think it's a reasonable question. I mean, I'm, I'm finding that when I stay with the Word of God, look at the Word of God, and especially listen to Jesus, I will never and can never go wrong. So this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, this is what will happen. Now, I want you to consider something, and what, the, the, the consideration I want you to give to this is the context in which this was written. What is the context of this passage in, um, in, in Mark, Mark, this last chapter of Mark, Mark 16? The context of this passage is really the preaching of the gospel. Um, in, in verse 15, it says, um, it says in verse, in, in verse 15, it says that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's, so the context of the, of the passage is the gospel. And um, so it tells you clearly here in this passage that those who believe the gospel and is baptized will be saved. And it also tells you those who don't believe the gospel will be damned. So I want you to see that what is dealing with is the believing of the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, these signs shall follow who? Them that believe. Believe what? Them that believe the gospel. Amazing, isn't it? Look, let us go on. What then is the gospel? Let me ask you, what is the gospel? Now everybody knows the gospel is the good news. The gospel is the good news wrapped up in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, so God's love, God's love for us resulted in sending in him sending Jesus Christ to save us from death, to save us from from sin, to save us from separation from God, and reuniting us with God, because that's really, um, at, at its very core, that's what sin is, separation from God. So Jesus took our experience of separation from God, which is sin, uh, and in fact, Peter says that he did that on the tree. He was separated from God, or God separated from him, and made him to be sin, according to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. He was made to be sin when God separated from him, so that we all, you and I, and every person in him, might be made the righteousness of God in him. I want you to think about that. We were sinners because of our separation from God. We were condemned to death because of our separation from God. We did naturally the works of the flesh because of our separation from God. We were living uh, the, the life of Adam. We possessed the very life of Adam, and that is what separated us from God. That selfish life was what separated us from God. Now, the good news is that Jesus took that separation and exchanged it for union. He took the separation from God, which is sin, and gave us union with God, which is righteousness. So the gospel then is to believe this truth. The gospel is to believe this reality that we have been translated from the old life of sin into the new life of righteousness in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the gospel. Now my question really is, do we believe it? That's really the crunch. But when you come down to it, this is really it. Do you believe that? Now, we say it because the word of God says it. But do you believe it? I mean, the, the, the perspective I want you to see is that do you believe that you are no longer the condemned sinner? Do you really believe that, that the right, you possess the righteousness of God? The Father's own righteousness that you possess that? I mean, the the um, the question, the answer that you will give is yes, I believe. Any Christian who, 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 who is asked this question will normally answer, yes, I believe. But do you really believe it? I mean, your mouth said it, but is it the truth in your heart? Is it the truth in your life and the truth in your experience? Because it is not what you say, it's what you're believing. Isn't that true? 
David says of the fool, the fool said in his heart, he has said this in his heart, there is no God. It's not something that he says with his mouth. I suppose he does say with his mouth, there is a God. But what is it that you're believing? I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying, and I'm seeing where the, the reality that we possess is not something we confess. And I'll explain. Listen to the preachers and the teachers today. The preachers and teachers um, of Christianity. Listen to them today. And they talk and glorify in their failure. They talk about their sinfulness instead of talking about the, what God did for them in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. They talk about um, their failings and how merciful God is and gracious God is. All of that is true. But they glorify failure. They glorify sin instead of glorifying righteousness and sinlessness because that is what God did for us. Now, you don't have to agree with me. Just think about it and you'll see that what I'm saying is the truth. Think about your own life, how you live. Now, here's the perspective. The perspective is that what the word of God did or said to me, what God has done to me, he has redeemed me. me. So I redeemed. I am forgiven. I am justified. I am in Christ. I, I, I am not in Adam. I, I, I'm, I'm a son of the Almighty God. I'm a representative, an ambassador of the kingdom of God in heaven. Do you see my point? Now, how then do I clear, declare myself to be a sinner? If this is true, how do I declare myself to be a sinner and talk about my failings? If what I said is true, are both things true at the same time? I mean, I, I want you to think about that because. Um, I've personally proven something as I've traveled um, around and come to a different country. I've personally proven something, and I, I'll tell you what I what what, what I did. Um, I've asked questions in different in the different congregations that we have met, different camp meetings wherever we we have been dealing with Christians generally, Christians, and and, and the question that I've asked is simply this: um, Let me see a show of hands of all the sinners in this room, and generally speaking. We'll have more than half of the people, um, I, I say probably half to 90% would say, would raise their hand that they, they, are, they are sinners. And then I say, wow, amazing. All right, let me see a show of hands of all the saints in this room. And you, you see some some unsure, not, not sure what to do, hands kind of going up, but very rare when you have more people. Uh, Accepting or professing or declaring that they're saints, then you have them declare that they're sinners. And I found that to be very interesting. Because the reason is that most people don't know their reality. And I've tried it in several places, not just one. And you've probably been in the meetings that I've been at, and you've probably heard me speak at different different places and heard me ask the same question. And the reason is, is because people have not been educated um, to the truth. And what the truth is about themselves in Christ. See, we read the verse and we say, look, we quote them. Um, Any man who's in Christ Jesus is a new creation. All things are past, all things are become new. Is that true? Or is that just a verse that you have memorized and committed to memory? Is that really the truth? Are you really new? What is the newness? See my point? And that's what I'm saying. I just, I just, I understand why we we have this this reality, uh, where we have this experience of not seeing the reality. Because the word of God tells us clearly something that is that stands perfectly um, plain and straight. These signs shall follow them that believe. That's what the word says. What are we believing? That is the question I, I want to pose to you. In fact, um, I, I, I say this, um, I, I really do believe that one, the greatest, the greatest um, hindrance, the, great, the greatest hindrance to the people of God in New Testament times is sin consciousness. Sin consciousness. That's why every day we pray and we beg God to forgive me of my sins that I've committed today. Every day we say, Lord, um, uh, we talk about these. <laughs> Remember, listening to my parents pray. Uh, all my years, I'm, I'm listening to the same. These and other unmentioned mercies. I mean, things, I mean, I listen to certain things that just became cliches. I listen to things that, and look, the culture has been passed on, and we're all in the same boat, you're all in the same boat, not, not sure, 
not, don't know what to think because you're not being taught the truth. We're, we're stuck listening to the word of God and listening to now the interpretation of preachers and the interpretation of teachers instead of listening to what the word says. You mean the spirit is not able to guide you into all the truth as Jesus promised? And so this this, I, I think there is this frustration, there is this frustration that we bring to the grace of God, the frustration to the love of God. See, we talk, it's amazing, God's love is so awesome. What is, that, what is it doing to you every day, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis? Did Jesus forgive you? Didn't, what did Paul say in Romans chapter 3? Didn't he talk about your sins that were past? So what did he forgive you of? Sins that were past, but what about the present sin and the future sins? Were all of those not forgiven in Christ Jesus? That's kind of the perspective I want to bring, bring to you and to your mind. Now, do you remember the story of the woman that they, and caught in the dark? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that story now. And I'm thinking about Jesus um, saying something. It was interesting what he said, because they were ready to stone her to death. And so he went, he, 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 he stooped down, started writing some, some things, and, and everybody left. And he said, woman, we are your accusers. He said, have they not condemned you? Then he says, neither do I condemn you. But remember the question, he that is without sin cast the first stone. Let me ask you, all those people gathered around and who had already had the stones in their hands, who was qualified to stone that woman? The only qualified person was Jesus. The only qualified person was Jesus because he was sinless. He is sinless. Because of that, he was qualified to do that. But did he do it? No. He said, neither do I condemn you. So, I mean, the perspective is, is, is that what he did was use his power, use his authority to empower the woman. So he didn't condemn her. He simply gave her a command. It was not just a suggestion or an advice. He said, look, Go and sin no more. He was empowering her life. And by empowering her life, what happened? She became a believer. She, she trusted in him. And that is the reality uh, of what he wants to do today. So believers are not nominal people that says, I'm a believer. I believe. Does that mean you're a believer? No. Believers, to be a believer is not to declare so much that you believe as it is to prove by demonstration that you believe. And that's what I think um, is happening. Um, when I look at the word of God, that's what I think is, is, is really causing the failures in our lives is, is that we have not really believed, believed God, believed Jesus into what he says. Um, I want us then to, to think about my, my opening verses, the, the verses I just quoted from Mark 16, 17 and 18. These signs shall follow them that believe. Now, here, here is the question I'd like to ask. And I'm asking this from the honest heart of, of those who are listening. If you Jesus says these signs, let's, let's go back to that verse. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And he said, in my name, in my name, they shall do a few things. You got what it says. I'm just saying with this. I'm just, we don't need to race ahead and, and, and find all of these other verses to, to, um, to accompany. No, just look at what this one is saying. And then we go to another one. Look at that one is saying. Because it's saying the same thing. But do we believe it? Are we believers? Are we believing the truth? Look at what it says. These signs shall follow who beloved? Them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink every deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recall. That's what the word of God says. So I'm going to ask you now, if you're honest in your heart, if you, if you know that there's a devil-possessed person, you go to cast out the devil, and that devil is not cast out, what is the problem? I want you to think. The word tells you what you ought to do, if you're a believer, now if you go to do this and the devil does not leave, what is the problem? You have not believed. I mean, am I, am, I, am I saying something that is not true? See, you might claim to be a believer, but the test of your believing comes down to what Jesus said the believers would do. So I 
can pray. Look, I can pick up my chest and say, look, I'm a believer. I believe this. But the proof of my believing will be what Jesus says. When I, when I speak to a demon-possessed person, what happens? When I lay my hands on the sick, what happens? If the sick does not recover, if the sick that I pray for I lay my hands on die, it tells me something. I am not believing. If I was believing, the difference would be clear. And I hope you're seeing that. I'm, I'm, I'm not putting anything, I'm not even putting my, my, my own bias on that. I'm simply taking the word of God and what it says. In fact, I'll, I'll go on more um, and, and say some more that I think um, condemns my, me, condemns me, because look, I pray for the sick and they die. Do you think I'm telling you that I'm different from you? Do you think I'm telling you that I'm a believer and you're not? No, I'm simply saying we're all in the same boat. I'm simply saying we all have a problem. And the problem is we have not believed in Jesus. We have not accepted the truth about ourselves. And that is an injurious to us because we have fears and all of that. Look, the word says, look, the word says, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name. Can I interject for a second, please? In my Support. name, you shall speak with new tongues. Um, um, hold that interjection. Let me just finish the talk. In my name, you shall speak with new tongues. My question is, when I go to another country and I have to use a translator to speak, is that because I don't believe? I just want you to think about it. Is that because I don't believe? Because this is the reality that we are seeing in the word of God. Look. I see the word of God and see what it says. When I look around me, I don't see anybody fulfilling that word. We say a lot of things. And you know me, I have a big one. I say a lot of things. But it's not what I say per se. It is what is demonstrated based on what the word of God says. Let's, 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 let's compare that to salvation. The word of God says we are saved by his grace. No, let's, let's use Paul's analogy of, of, of what he says. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Okay? Not of works, through faith. So God's grace has provided salvation. How do I, re I receive that salvation? I receive it through faith. Now I can say I'm saved. There's, how do I prove that I'm saved? There's no way to prove that I'm saved. It's simply what I said. But the proof comes, the reality comes from the person who, who says they're saved, believes they're saved, so they're saying something happens in their life. Their life you know, begins to show and bring forth a testimony that they truly have been with Jesus. Somebody had a question. Who was that? Me, Brother Raymond. Go ahead, Raymond. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. Um... Uh, you know, the unbeliever cannot be saved, number one. That, that's absolutely truth. And the believer should have the power uh, to heal in the sense when the believer prays over a person and they put their hands on them, they should be healed. But there is, uh, there is one point here that I want to interject and in that we need to recognize. When Jesus healed people or they came to him, they, he asked them, do you believe? If they would have said no, if they would not have faith, if they were unbeliever and they did not have faith, they would not be healed. And I think that this is the um, this is the part where we have to be very careful because, you know, we are believers. We we know we are newborn Christians and we have received the life of Christ within. But I would say that ninety percent of the time that we pray pray for these people to get healed, they themselves don't believe. They expect for our beliefs to heal them, and, 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 and you know, and I just wanted to clarify that because we have been praying for people to be healed, and they haven't. And it's not because of, of, our, of where we stand that with God; it is because where the other party stands that as well. I believe. All right, appreciate that. Thank you, Brother Raymond. Uh, so the the point, um, and, and let me just make a comment based on what Brother Raymond says. The, 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 the point is that it is true that we are to be pointing people to Christ. We are to be pointing people to the reality of faith, that if they can believe. Look, I just read the word of Jesus. When this man came to him, he, he had his son. Um, he brought his son to be healed. He could not, uh, he could not, they could not heal him. And so 
he finally came to Jesus and Jesus says, all things are possible to him that believe it. Okay? If thou canst believe, that's what Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. What did Jesus, what did this man say? All right, so this man answered, he says, I believe, I believe, help my unbelief. All right, so he's saying something. He's saying, it was because of my faith why I came. I heard about it why I came. But when I came, I saw what had happened to your disciples. Nine of them tried to cast out this demon out of my son, and it didn't happen. So it caused unbelief to grow in my heart. Help my unbelief. How did Jesus help his unbelief? was simple. He believed for him. So there are cases where it is important for some people to believe, okay? Uh, but what about Lazarus? Who believed for Lazarus? See my point? So I'm simply saying, the, the, while Brother Raymond, what he said is true, it is also true that, um, that your faith can cover the person who have a need but is not even able to believe, you can believe for that person. A person is about invalid or born and handicapped and so on, and you're there to pray for that person. It is your faith. It is the faith that is in you. I mean, I've been at that place. It's easy to take the, to put the blame on. I mean, I heard a brother and says, and a friend of ours, we were somewhere in, in, in the U.S., and, 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 and Brother David was preaching about the same issue, and the guy came and he said, look, man, he said, my, my father, I think he said it was, that was dying from cancer. And the, the elders came. They were doing what the word says. Um, Call for the elder, let them, elders, let them anoint with oil and pray. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And so they were there praying and anointing. And nothing was happening to it. And, and they were, the elders were now saying, see, you will not believe. Because of, you will not believe. And because you're not believing, you're not being healed. And so he, he, he even, um, I think he, he came to the conclusion that it was the elders that killed his father. They pressured him and he said, I mean, what else do I do, brother? What should I do? He said, see, but we are praying and you are not being healed. So it's easy to cast it off into the person. I said, well, I'm in faith. I'm, uh, I'm praying the prayer of faith, but you don't believe and that's why you're not healed. I mean, the perspective here that Jesus brings is that, the, look, it never happened to Jesus. Do you think everybody that Jesus touched believed? No. You think everybody Jesus spoke to believe? No. But when he spoke, the reality of what he said came into fruition, came into existence, and that caused their faith to climb and to raise to that level. So anyway, uh, I just said that, and go back, going back to where we were, I'm just saying, look, I mean, I put myself in the situation, right? I, I see where if Brother David talked about uh, the, the, the video that came for, for the top, from the tornado that, that hit um, in that area of Kansas that destroyed a few of the brethren place. I think Brother Brother um the Mario's house was was totally um well I saw the video it was completely demolished and they actually ran into a, a container ran into a, a, a 40 foot container or something and that tornado flipped that thing three times I think and they were in it. Anyway here's my point I'm just looking at the story and, and look, I, I, my, my own self is condemned. Don't, don't think that I'm saying something to condemn you. Think about what I'm saying as a reality that we are all equipping the saints. We're all being equipped to stand in the reality that we have been given. Jesus was in a boat sleeping. You know the story, Mark, Mark 4, um, Luke, 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 somewhere, Luke 8, I think. They were in a boat and they were, and Jesus was tired. He went to sleep. So it's not really a boat. He was in a ship and he was sleeping in the hinder part of the ship. And, and a storm broke out upon the ship, um, on the sea. And they were trying desperately to save themselves, to bail them whatever they were doing to save themselves. They recognized that it will not happen. Then they remembered Jesus. They went and found him. They said, don't you care that we perish? Now, I want to ask, I want to ask you a question. But maybe I should go and read the passage. It's two verses. Don't, don't, uh, you're familiar with the verse, I'm sure. But I want you to look at what it says here in, in, um, in Mark chapter... Four. That's Mark four. I forget. Mark four. Look, look at look at what 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 it said here in the last part of this this passage. Look at what it says here. And he arose. See, see verse thirty eight. And he was in the in the part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And look at what he does. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said, look at this now, and he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? It's interesting. How is it that you have no faith? Let, let me see if I can just um, jump across to Luke 8 and, uh, and find the same story. 
and look at what he says here. In, in, he rebuked the wind, um, according to Luke, he said he rebuked, he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging water, and they seized, and there was a calm, and he said unto them, where is your faith? Now, what, what, what is the reason for this question? Why did Jesus even ask this question? What was he trying to say? He was simply saying that they had the ability to do the same thing that he was doing. But instead of standing in their reality, they looked at the water, they looked at the wind, and they became afraid. So that is the reason for asking, where is your faith? In other words, you are supposed to, you were supposed to do the same things that I did. Now, I'm from Jamaica. Hurricane, um, um, hurricanes will, are, are always threatening Jamaica because we're a tropical island. We're right, 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 we're, wherever we are situ situated, and, and, and I'm not even able to tell you the, the geographical um, jargons, uses, using those jargons to tell you, but we are prone to hurricanes, and every year, and I've been through a few of them myself, but I tell you what, when I look at this, I realize when, when we hear that hurricane is coming, the first thing we try to do is we try to button up the windows. If I could switch my camera around, I could show you some windows that still have tape on, on, on the glass, right? That's what we do. We button the windows, we secure the doors, and we make sure that everything is good. So when we, we brace ourselves, we brace ourselves, like those folks back there in Kansas, we brace ourselves for the hurricane to come and to pass and hope that we have, we have no major casualty. Is that the truth of the child of God? Is that who you and I have been made to be? I mean, look, I, I know of no one. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. I, I, I did hear, I, I did see a video of some folks in, in the Philippines. Just, just come to think of this. I did see a video of some folks in the Philippines who, who, who were threatened by a tornado was coming their way. And these people started to pray. These people, they had their phones up, they were just praying and speaking in tongues and praying alone and doing all sorts of things. And they, I mean, in two minutes, I think the, the clip I saw was two minutes, and I did share it with a few people here, if you can remember, maybe some years back. But in two minutes, that tornado dissipated before their faces. And it was all praise and glory and hallelujah because these people stood up, took the word of God for what it said and they saw the reality before their very eyes. And you can probably go on YouTube, maybe I can even take a look quickly here, but it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you, this is something amen, that I... Amen, amen, hallelujah. Yeah, it's still up. It's still up. Um, chasing away a tornado in Jesus' name. If, if you go on YouTube and check that out, you'll find it there um, uh, right now. What I'm just saying is that it's interesting that the only time that I've ever heard or seen of any such well, I've, I've read of this in the Word of God, and I realize this is what Jesus is saying. Look, you think I've lived for 50 years in this in this in this world of darkness. Do you think that the people are in darkness alone? We can educate me about what the Word of God says. That's what people try to do. They try to educate you. When you step out on the limb and say, look, I'm standing for Jesus. They try to say, look, be careful. Be careful. All right. I appreciate your concern and your care for me. But pray that I will, will find my reality. Pray that what I'm seeking after, I will find. That's, that's kind of the perspective. I will not say that we are, this is how it has gone for 50 years and 100 years. And, and No, I'm saying the word of God is true, even when it is darkness around me. Even when I don't see the light of what is being said, the word of God is still true. And I look at the word of God and what the word of God says is that this is the reality in the life of those who are believing. Those who are believing him, those who have faith in him, they will see this manifested in their lives. And I, I want, this is kind of what I want to bring out to you because when I, when, I, when I think about this, my question is, was Jesus crazy in the thing that he said? Like I heard Brother David said something, which I agree with. You cannot make blood out of stone. But I know somebody who can. Hallelujah. You know what his name? His name is Jesus. He can make blood out of stone. He can make stone out of blood. He can do anything. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. I can't. I can't do anything. But I am in him who can. I was, I was sharing with somebody recently. And, and I found this to be interesting. 
Um, it is clear who I am. I am a son of I am in Christ. That is very clear. I was saying to your brother, I said, I am the righteousness of God. I have the righteousness of God. And he said, in Christ. And I said, that's where I am. I'm in Christ. How do, how, but how? Go ahead, brother. Brother it was it was good hearing your voice i'm sorry i didn't greet you when i came on but it was i was happy to hear your voice go ahead good to be here i'll tell you and this sermon is so great brother david how do i obtain this faith i want it how do i attain this faith how do i thank you very much all right great so this is the perspective with three minutes to go um and, and my producer making it clear that i'm looking at the, the, the my timer that i have a new timer now that that sets my time so i don't go over over my time um so this is the way jesus is i mean he was not crazy when he said these things was he no because he knew that this would happen if we could only believe you know we used to sing a song when i was younger um, and, and I suppose you know this too. It, it, we used to do this a lot at Crusade. It says, um, only believe. That's not, no, I think I, I messed up the day with it. But only believe, only believe. All things are possible if we only believe. Now, as Brother Sam asked the question, how do we believe? And I think that is probably where we're going to look at next, where we're going to go to next, but it's not going to be this week for sure because my time is almost gone. But we look at that next week. How do we believe? Because this is, I believe, it is the core of the Christian's life. It is the core of, of what, look, did you record, did you, I said this before, but I, I need to repeat this again. The new biology, the, the scientists, uh, well, one scientist uh, made a major breakthrough in the medical field because he finally found what causes the human body to perform. And what I mean by that, what causes the human body to, to, um, to develop? And he said, it is not, and he did this because of some experiments he did in the lab. But he, anyway, what he found out was that it is what we're believing. The environment and all of that controls what we believe. The environment that we're being, because he said he would have taken cells from a person who is dying with cancer, and you take that cell from that person, change the environment, and that cell will become a healthy cell and thrive and, and do very well. So it said, what causes this? And he found out in a certain environment where there's certain stress, there's certain belief system, he says that also contributes to sickness. Very interesting, very interesting. And you can look at this, just, just go to YouTube and type in the new biology if you have the time to look at that. It takes it off into the, um, the, the realm of, 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 of um, new age. But if you think about what is being said, and if you think about what he found out, he realizes the truth that he's talking. He's saying the cells in our body all move based on what we believe, the environment that it's in, what we're believing. And if that is true, I can understand now why God said the just should live by faith. I can understand now why without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because it's not just God made something called faith. The entire universe is set up on this. The entire, all human beings are set up this way. Our bodies are designed this way that we will believe. And it's by what we believe that we will see and, 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 and experience the reality in Christ. Um, with a few seconds to go, brothers and sisters, I just want to say thank you so much for your time and your company this morning. Thank you for spending the time to just listen to these two verses. And it's all we've discussed today, just two verses. If you can believe, all things are possible. And that's what we're leaving for today.